Okay, um, my name is Wu Xiaogang, okay, from uh, uh, Division of Social Science. Uh, uh, today it's my honor to chair this uh, distinguished IAS, distinguished lecture, okay, joined with uh, Division of Social Science. We have honor to have our uh, guest speaker, Professor uh, Steve Lautenbusch from University of Chicago, okay, coming to here to give us a, a lecture called Can School uh, Improve uh, re uh, Reduce Inequality? I remember uh, a, a long time ago, about nine years ago, okay, so when IAS was initially funded, um, a lot of initial funding, we actually, I launched a series called uh, a series of uh, inequality and poverty. We have brought uh, a lot of uh, dis distinguished uh, speakers, right? Uh, it's uh, been adamant for a while, okay? So you see a lot of activities going on at IAS, right? Uh, not much in social science. There are some, right? But uh, compared to, uh, you know, many lectures, which I don't know what they're talking about, right? So this is really uh, the topic today, right? The inequality, we care about that. You know, education, we care about it. Uh, child development. This is all not only sociologists, right? You know, economists and uh, political scientists, all social scientists should care about, it. and the policy policy researchers. Okay, uh, so let me give a, a brief introduction of uh, uh, Professor uh, Rottenbush. Uh, Professor Rottenbush received his uh, doctorate degree in education, right, in policy analysis and evaluation from Harvard. Then he started uh, his first job at uh, Michigan State. Uh, after that, he moved to uh, University of Michigan. Well, I think we share the same cubicle, right? At that time, I was very junior, okay? I was uh, very afraid talking to him, okay? Um, uh, so after I left in 2005, right? So I left in 2003, and uh, as, uh, Professor Lautenbush left for University of Chicago, okay? At to, uh, in 2005, now he is a Lewis uh, uh, Sibring Distinguished Service uh, Professor uh, in the Department of Sociology at the University of Chicago. Um, Professor Lautenbush, his research interest uh, in statistic, uh, uh, is in statistical modeling in child and youth development within social settings such as uh, uh, neighborhood um, uh, schools and, uh, and a classroom. Uh, he's best known, okay, in the class I teach, right, he's best known for a model called uh, a, a, a hierarchical linear model. Sometimes we call it, uh, you know, HLM, uh, HLM right, in abbreviation. Uh, many of students, right, know and apply these models, okay, in their research. Uh, and um, uh, with broad impl implication of this model for uh, in the design and an analysis of longitudinal and multi-level uh, research. His current research uh, includes uh, the, the development of uh, literacy and uh, math skills in early childhood uh, with implication for instruction, method for assessing school um, and classroom quality, and a method for heterogeneous effect of intervention. Uh, Professor Lautenbusch is a well-established well you know, uh, scholar right, in the world, right? Okay, no? uh, he's an elected member of national, U.S. National Academy of Science, um, a fellow of American uh, Academy of Arts and Science, and a member of the U.S. National Academy of Education. He's also received, received a lot of uh, uh, awards, including a distinguished contribution to research uh, in education awards from American uh, education Asso uh, uh, research association. Uh, so uh, let's welcome uh, Professor Rottenbush to give us, uh, you know, a speech. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and and thank you, Professor Wu, for this invitation, this opportunity to come and speak to you at this beautiful campus. Uh, first time I've been here, I'm so impressed. I've been treated so well. I told Professor Wu, if they keep treating me this well, I might not leave. <laughs> you have to, you have to force me out. Um, so today. Um, I want to talk about a question that we've debated uh, for many years. Can school improvement reduce inequality? Now, we debate this question with great passion, although we rarely define what we mean by inequality or school improvement. <laughs> but that doesn't stop us from having this debate. In fact, it probably makes the debate more intense, the fact that we never define these things. But I will try to define these today. Um, the talk is based on uh, uh, an article I wrote with Robert Eshman in the Annual Review of Sociology uh, and two recent uh, randomized experiments with my colleagues, whose names are listed here. Um, and I'm going to, I'll talk about the, the general question 
is really dealt with in the annual review of sociology paper, and then a couple of attempts to improve schools are in these two randomized uh, experiments that I'll talk about today. So um, what I'm going to say may sound to you, I'm not sure if it will, like an American story. Uh, it is situated in the United States, but we have to remember that schooling has universal characteristics. Not, schools are different around the country, around the world, but in many ways they have the same, very similar characteristics. We live in a global economy that shapes schooling everywhere. The kinds of skills that people need are more similar than ever and will continue to be more and more similar. And the concern about social inequality is worldwide. So I'm hoping that this will have some relevance wherever your research takes you and you can tell me at the end whether this is true. But I really want to focus on kind of two parts of this question or two questions. Uh, one is, as schooling now exists, does schooling increase or reduce social inequality? And by schooling in this case, I mean literally going to school. If two children go to school for the same amount of time, and one child comes from a rich family and one child comes from a poor family, do they benefit equally or, or differently from going to school? Okay, that's what I mean by, uh, by uh, schooling. And then the second question, which is, turns out to be very closely related, is whether we can make things better. Can school reform reduce social inequality? Can we change schooling in a way that will enable us to reduce social inequality? So we, I think those two questions have to be considered together to provide an answer. So the outline of this talk is, uh, first, right now, I'll say something about defining what do I mean by educational equality or inequality. So for me, educational equality does not mean that every child would have the same outcomes, nor does it mean that every child will have the same opportunity. It's something in between those two. The way I think about it, we would have educational equality if every child by a certain age, let's just say age 10 or eight, 9 or 10, in that neighborhood, if every child could read with high levels of comprehension, could articulate his or her thoughts in writing persuasively, reasonably persuasively, or in speaking, that is, could articulate ideas, make arguments, and could reason at some reasonable level mathematically. Now, to make that precise, I would need to define how high level the comprehension would have to be, how good the writing would have to be, or how well people could speak, or how well they would try to reason. I'm not going to do that here. We could do, we can do that. Um, and some of the people that I'm going to talk about who've been doing wonderful work have, have done that. But the idea is this. If we achieve this high level for everyone, no one would be excluded from a debate or a discussion by virtue of not having those basic skills. No one would be left out. Everyone would be, in a sense, at the table. Also, children would have the option of using those skills to gain knowledge in areas in which they were, would be interested. People would differ in what they would, how they would use those skills. And, but they wouldn't be excluded from searching for knowledge because they couldn't read, or they couldn't write clearly, or they couldn't reason quantitatively. And that would also mean that people would have options for continued schooling, and they could look across different types of employment and match their interest to some kind of reasonable work that would be satisfying to them. So that kind of inequality, which really, in some sense, means just having a very high minimum standard. But I call it equality because it's equality of access to those basic uh, uh, features of what we think make human life uh, valuable. And, and we could also discuss the potential of uh, having those skills for being able to live a healthy life and, and live a long time. Um, so we know that education is highly connected with health. So that's what I mean by, um, by equality. You would have to have equality, some degree of equality of opportunity to get where I want to go. But you would, again, you would not have equal outcomes. Some people might be wonderful at reading very difficult 
uh, advanced uh, literature or philosophy, or some people might be wonderful at mathematics or music. All of those, all of that variability would be would be enjoyable to have, if everyone had this level of educational equality. I want to say something about the historical push for equality in education because it hasn't been the case that our schools sought uh, in, in our country to, or and I think in any society, always to produce, uh, to, to achieve equality. And in order to understand whether we can make things better, we need, in my view, a theoretical model for what I'm going to call the causal effect of going to school. What is the impact of actually going to school versus staying home? And how does that vary for different kinds of children? Answering that question is going to be critical to the project of understanding whether we can make schools better in order to uh, increase equality. And uh, that model will leave us to lead us to believe that schooling will equalize outcomes for young children. So we'll, we'll, we'll ask why, why it, and, and I'm going to give some empirical evidence to support and, and at this claim and ask, why does schooling equalize outcomes for little children? That is, for children who are young, children from lower income families will benefit more than children from higher income families from going to school. That's what this theory is going to say. And then we'll look at the evidence. And we're also going to ask, why is it the case that schooling disequalizes outcomes for older children? So when you get older, two kids who go to school who are older, on average, the, high, the, the, the rich child, the high income child, will benefit more than the low income for older children. OK? It seems paradoxical. And having answered those questions, then we can, we can then entertain the question of how school reform can reduce inequality. So we have to really understand the impact of going to school and how it differs across different kinds of children before we can really uh, assess the question of how we can make things better. So going back a, a ways to, uh, and I have to admit it, when I was in school, uh, a very famous so sociologist named Petrim Sorokin wrote the following thing. He said, at the present moment, it is certain that the school, while being a training and educational institution, is at the same time a piece of social machinery which tests the abilities of the individuals, which sifts them, selects them, and decides their prospective social position. So this is a key concept that some of my economics colleagues don't understand. They, they view the school as a firm that produces uh, academic skills the way a, a factory tries to produce profits. But schooling had, has historically had a different purpose, which is basically to certify people for different roles in society. And this certification process begins, according to Parsons and others, uh, early. Some, some, some would say Ray Rist, uh, the first day of kindergarten, this process of, of stratification and, and, and classification, sifting and selecting and deciding people's fate begins very early. How does this happen? Well, one key structural feature of schools, this is at the secondary level, well, I'm not going to talk about the primary level yet, is called tracking. I'm sure many, how many people know what I mean when I say the word tracking? Does that mean anything to you at all? Is, how many people does it not mean anything? Let me say, yeah, some of you are a little, uh, you're abstaining, but that's okay. Um, so when I was in school and you went to high school, a public high school, large school, maybe 2,000 kids, kids from different social backgrounds, different parts of a city, you would be assigned to one of three tracks. If you were a boy, and typically a boy of working class background, you would be assigned to a vocational track. You would be learning how to work with wood, with metals, with electricity, with printing, various kinds of trades. Because it was understood that you were going to become a manual worker who was going to be, a, at best, hopefully a skilled tradesman. If you were um, a working class girl, it's more likely that you would be put in what we would call the general track. In the general track, you learned how to type. 
because there were a lot of jobs as secretaries uh, typing up manuscripts. When I, when I started at Michigan State, the professors who were nearly all men would come in with manuscripts and there would be a typing pool of women and you would hand your handwritten manuscript and they would type your manuscript. There were pools of typists. And uh, you also, in the general track, would learn how to, the home economics, how to sew and how to cook food and how to take care of a household. Um, and for a very small number of people, you would be in the academic track, which meant that you were in preparation to go to the university. And this would be decided at entry to secondary school when you were about 14 or 15 years old. Where you lived made a big difference. In the city I grew up in, Minneapolis, Minnesota, there were about 15 high schools. And there were only two high schools that actually ever sent any large number of people to college. At the other 13 high schools, it was presumed that you were not going to go to college. So that was a long time ago. But there are many, artif there are many aspects of that system still in place. Uh, many of them have also eroded or been, have been gotten rid of. Racial inequality is, is uh, a crucial aspect of this in the United States because of our history of slavery and Jim Crow segregation. And, and also because just the continuing residential segregation of people by race. So black people living in certain sections of a city, white people living in certain sections, then that black people tending to be of lower social status, more likely to be working class and background, um, therefore would be going to the schools that did not prepare you for college. Starting in the 1960s, there was a big push against this kind of system. The civil rights movement in the US, the, the, the movement for racial equality was crucial to this. The, the war on poverty was symbolized a, a culture in which people were fighting against uh, persistent intergenerational uh, poverty. And President Johnson uh, said in 1964, poverty must not be a bar to learning and learning must offer an escape from poverty. So it then became the, the policy of the federal government of the United States to promote educational equality. Um, and looking over the 100 years between 1900 and 2000, um, Derek Neal, my colleague at Chicago, has a wonderful paper in which he documents dramatic reduction in racial inequality during that time. Social class inequality in educational outcomes has remained persistent. And in fact, according to Sean Reardon's interesting work in 2013, may have increased over the last 40 years. So here we have a policy that's designed to promote equality, and yet we see inequality being very persistent. And this raised the question then, does it make any sense to think that schools have enough power to overcome inequality? And an extremely influential work by James Coleman in 1965 called Equality of Educational Opportunity uh, basically, what Coleman found was that school differences, differences in the quality of the buildings, the libraries, the um, science laboratories, qual the qualifications of the teachers, the pay of the teachers, the spending per pupil of the students, did little to predict achievement. This was a shock to people. People thought if we could just put people in better schools, the low-income kids, we could overcome inequality. Coleman said that's not going to work. The reason is that families are so widely variable as a function of social background and because families are so important, because parents are so important as the first educators of their children, providing them with cognitive skills and access to learning, that um, schooling was a weak force by comparison. And then another University of Chicago giant, uh, William Julius Wilson in 1987, wrote a book called The Truly Disadvantaged. And what he, uh, what he documented was, you see, millions and millions of black people had come from, from the rural south. They were farm workers moving into the cities. It was very similar to what you see in China with the, with the mass migration of people from the rural areas into the cities to find opportunities. And they found opportunities in the steel mills and in the auto factories in large-scale industry, which was flourishing at that time. But long about the 1970s, those jobs began to disappear. 
those people lost their jobs, and the American dream that they had seemed to have in their hands was, was falling away. And at the same time, because we had a civil rights movement, the African Americans, that is the black people who had more education, were able to move out of those segregated black neighborhoods, leaving behind a group of people that Wilson called the truly disadvantaged. The people who lost their jobs in the factories and didn't have enough skill to move out of the city were concentrated in the most disadvantaged neighborhoods uh, in the United States. And, and that concentration of disadvantage had powerful effects on the capacities of kids to, uh, to grow up in, in healthy surroundings and to, to be able to take advantage of schools. And they had a, actually bad effects on the quality of the schools themselves. So, we could say, we would, we would be inclined to say, since family differences are so important and since neighborhoods are so powerful and so unequal, how can we possibly expect the school to overcome those kinds of disadvantages? It's very widely held, particularly among more left-wing and progressive people in the United States, that, that it's very often held that schooling has very little uh, capacity to help kids. And I'm going to challenge that argument. Um, and uh, essentially, I'm going to be arguing that the result, this argument is a result of misinterpreting the Coleman report, James Coleman's ideas, and that of Julius Wilson. In order to understand the significance of Coleman, we need a causal model for schooling. We need a theoretical model. And I want to offer you that model. I want to use it to explain why schooling is crucial to reducing inequality, and I want to provide then a couple of examples of how powerful schools can actually be so, in, in helping us reduce inequality. So here are the propositions of this model. Um, the first is that low-income children benefit more from early schooling on average than do high-income children. The, the second is that by adolescence, high-income kids benefit more from schooling than do low-income kids. So schooling, which is equalizing when you're young, becomes disequalizing when you get older. Um, that preschool and elementary school improvement can reduce inequality by prolonging the equalizing effect of schooling. Okay. And, and, I'm gonna, and, and even if we don't desegregate neighborhoods, which I hope we could, and even if we don't uh, help families function more effectively, which I wish we would, that schooling can make a big difference. That's the argument. So uh, here's the first claim. Low-income kids benefit more from early schooling on average than do high-income kids. And uh, they, so we're going to use a counterfactual account of causality to make this case. So it's very simple. It's a very simple, unbelievably simple model, but for some reason, reading the literature, nobody seems to think about this this way, uh, counterfactually. So I'm going to define um, Q school as the quality of academic instruction that a child would, uh, would uh, um, experience if they attend school. This is a child-specific model. This is a model for one person, because Q school is going to vary across kids. But every kid has a Q school. That's how much the quality of my academic instruction if I go to school, OK? Q home is the quality of the academic I'm in, instruction I'm going to get at home. And that might seem crazy, like, what do you mean, academic instruction at home? Yes, because parents are teachers of their children. You learn how to speak at home. You learn an enormous amount before you ever go to school language and all of the ideas that correspond to the words in your, voc in your vocabulary and the size of your vocabulary is strongly predicted by the social background and educational level of your parents, OK? So we can talk about investments, parental investments, and they could be involved resources. But a lot of what the parents are investing is, is a result of their own human capital just transferring it through how they interact with their children. So what that means is that the impact of going to school as opposed to staying home, that is the difference between the quality of instruction you get at school versus home, that's the first effect of going to school. That's a causal effect of going to school. And then, but the other key ingredient is the 
the impact of, an, of any instruction, wherever you get it, whether it's at home or at school, on your skill, how much you learn is going to be called delta. Okay. So that means putting those two simple ideas together, the impact of going to school on academics is the difference between the quality of instruction you receive times the benefit of instruction. Very simple idea, okay? But a lot of interesting things follow from this. So why does school equalize? Because the quality of school, and, and this seems very ironic, okay? Rich kids, high SES, socioeconomic status, SES. I'll use that term. I hope that's okay. SES, socioeconomic status, sort of high income. Uh, generally, high SES parents have uh, more, more education, higher levels of occupational attainment, and more earnings. So I'll just use SES as a, as a simple idea. High SES kids are going to have better quality schools than low SES kids. High SES kids are going to have better quality at home in terms, not in terms of love or in terms of emotional support necessarily, but in terms of the academic instruction you receive if your parents are more highly educated, right? And so these both cues are facing, favoring the high SES kids, but the difference between Q school and Q home is going to be higher for low SES kids. Everybody see that? Because, and the reason is because homes vary more than schools do. Homes vary a huge amount by SES. Schools vary, but not as much. So the difference between the quality of school versus the quality of home is bigger on average for low SES kids than high SES kids. That's why schooling equalizing. Because if I go to school, and my mom, and I have a mom who has very, mother, who has very little education, who speaks very, let's say, uh, a non-standard, a non-academic dialect of English. This is going to happen in different ways in different countries, but different language people have. You know, most countries have a metropolitan language of instruction that you need to master to be good at academics. And in low-income families, it's more likely that parents don't have that because they didn't go, they didn't learn that in school. So their children don't have it, right? So, so... Um, uh, so, Q, um, so Q school is minus Q home is going to be higher for low SES kids. Any questions or thoughts, disagreements? Do you, if you, at my university, I already would have been interrupted seven times and you would have, <laughs> but that's okay. No, you guys, can, you're very polite here. But, and if you, you can challenge me though at any moment. Does it, does it make sense to you that uh, it's just kind of a simple-minded argument, but sometimes simple-minded things, if you put them together, are very useful. Um, you know, they say that in sociology, all we do is uh, teach people what grandmother could have told you. <laughs> uh, and th we do that, but we also teach the things that grandmother told you that were wrong, we teach you that that was wrong, too. So some of the stuff that grandmother said was right, but some of it was actually wrong. So, um, okay. So why does schooling disequalize? It just said it equalizes. Well, why does it, why does it disequalize? Well, because delta, which is the benefit of instruction, depends on how much you already know. So a very simple demonstration of the fact is that the reason that you are all here at this wonderful university is because somebody looked at your record and decided that you had a lot of skill. And because you had a lot of skill, they made the assumption you would benefit a lot from being here. That's why they didn't let in a whole bunch of people here who didn't have high levels of skill, like whose test scores and grades and all that other stuff were low. Because we, in, we intuitively believe you're going to benefit more from instruction for in one hour of instruction if you already have more skill. The more you, it's sort of the, the, you know, Jim Heckman would say skill begets skill. The more skill you have, the more capacity you have to learn faster. Okay? So, so because the high SES kids have the higher quality of instruction at school and at home, their deltas are going to grow faster than the deltas of the low SES kids. And so that's why schooling is, gonna, is going to disequalize. And, and so the impact of school, it's kind of a, a battle between two things. The fact that Q, oops, back, oh, here we go. The fact that Q school minus Q home is bigger for low SES kids, but Delta is getting bigger for high SES kids. And, uh, and, that's, and so it seems that SES gaps uh, uh, 
over time, as kids get older, the gaps favoring the high SES kids will accumulate and ultimately overtake the, uh, the qualities. And, and, and then the, the, uh, the difference in quality, and what's gonna happen is that um, the selection is gonna work, that society is gonna give more education to the people who have more skill. Okay, so that's, that's kind of the story of this model, very simple. So the question is, if this, is, if this simple model <laughs> holds, is there any evidence that actually supports it? <laughs> and I, I'm going to uh, be very brief on this because I, 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 I don't want to dwell on this. The, it's, it's, it's rather uh, sort of, I guess you could say, comprehensively discussed in our article in the Annual Review of Sociology. But, but basically, what we do in that article is we look at studies of universal pre-K, studies of lengthening the school day, studies of uh, lengthening uh, the school year, or you could say interrupting the school year with recess, and studies of extending the years of, uh, uh, of, not primary, that's wrong, of compulsory schooling. We've got a rich research base. Uh, most of this done by very capable economists who really know their causal inferences. And so I really, we, Robert Escher and I were very happy to read all of their articles and try to create a sociological explanation for economic findings. Um, so for universal pre-K, we review 15 studies in eight nations across a wide range of skills. Uh, these are really interesting studies because what happens is that um, society is going along and all of a sudden, um, it makes universal pre-K, which means like before you go to kindergarten, before you go to the regular school, you have a, a, a prior year of schooling. We, so let's say in our country, kids would typically go to school when they're five. So in Oklahoma, which is one of the states in our country, they decided, well, you can go to school when you're four, and we're going to make it, if not compulsory, we're going to make it free. And this has happened in societies all over the world at different times. And you, there's a very nice little research design. What you do is you take kids who, usually there's a, a cutoff point. If you're born before September 1 of that year, if you're, if you're four before September 1, you can go. But if you're four after September, you can't go because you're not old enough to go. And so these studies take the kids who are just on one side or the other of the eligible period, and then they follow the kids. And they use this technical, uh, technically as an instrumental variable, because not everybody who, who's eligible goes. And they, you can identify by comparing these kids who are very, very similar, except they have a very small difference in age. And because of that small difference, some go to school and some don't. And you can get a nice causal uh, estimate of the effect of going to preschool. And this has been done in societies all over the world. and. Uh, across the 15 studies, in 13 cases, very clearly low SES kids gained more from universal pre-K than did the high SES kids. Something happened in Quebec, which is a province of, Ant of Canada, that I don't understand because it turned out that preschool was kind of bad for kids. And I, we're not sure whether those were kids who were really from high SES homes who went to school, and maybe, the, maybe the, the parents were teaching them better at home than they would have at school. We're not sure about that. But generally speaking, it's very clear that uh, across the vast majority of studies, significant gains uh, for, on average, and much bigger effects for low SES kids than for high SES kids. And in some study, in some cases, the highest kids don't, don't actually ha gain. They don't gain academic skills from going to school. Their parents are teaching them a lot. They're not getting a benefit. They might be getting other benefits of going to school, and their parents are getting other benefits, like they can go to work, and they don't have to take care of their kids all day. <laughs> but the kids uh, may not be benefiting. OK. So what about extending the school year? Well, this is really interesting. So one thing we've known, and actually Tony Brike and I a long time ago did studies, did studies showing Something that, again, grandmother, anybody would tell, tell you, kids learn more academic stuff when they're in school than when they're not in school. The way we can learn this is by measuring how much they know at the beginning of the school year, at the end of the school year, and at the beginning of the school year, at the end of the school year, we can get a growth rate, how much you learn during the school year, and how much you learn during the summer when you're not in school, and the difference between those is a causal effect of going to school. It's a 
beautiful research design because the same person is being assessed when they're in school and without. You, have, you are your own control group, okay? And you can aggregate those. And what we see is that kids who are from high and low SES backgrounds have pretty similar rates of in, in, uh, learning when they're in school, not too different, but different late rates at home, okay? And, uh, and, and so that means that social inequality is going to grow during the summer uh, when kids are out of school. And these effects accumulate. We, have, we cite a whole bunch of studies. We, you can accumulate these effects of literally the one summer after the other. And it actually makes a difference. And we also have some very interesting uh, intervention studies showing that if you actually then increase the year, it act so in other words, what I'm saying is, um, Kids learn more when they're in school than when they're home, and that's more pronounced for low SES kids than for high SES kids, but that doesn't really prove that if you extended the year, people would benefit, but now we know from these other studies that if you extend the school year, kids will benefit. So that, that, that shows you that one way to reduce inequality is just to give more schooling to people when they're younger, when, they're, when, the, high, when the low SES kids are benefiting more. Okay, here's, here's a graphical representation of that from the early national research, nationally uh, representative research study. This is sort of a typical sort of high SES kid. This is a low SES kid. This is kindergarten uh, when they're just going to school. There's already, this is something I'm going to come back to, there's already a big gap in reading or, and math. It's very similar in the two subjects. When the kids enter school, they grow at similar rates. But the low SES kids fall back a little bit during the summer. The high SES kids don't. We think that the literacy environment of the home is, is helping the high SES kids uh, sustain their skills. Then there's, in, there's, there's uh, by the end of first grade. And notice that there was a gap coming in. And the gap at the end of first grade is a little bit bigger than it was coming in. And that's because it was incremented by the summer. And we can accumulate this over, a year, over the years. And so what happens is when the kids um, uh, go to, finally, when they go to secondary school and you take the tests and you get tracked into the academic track, the accumulation of those gaps, the initial gap, which is big, plus the slow accumulation is enough to have a difference in terms of who's going to get put into the high versus the low track of school, OK? Um, what about increasing instructional time during the school day? Um, well, we have some research. It's a little more mixed because some of the studies, it looks like, don't do much academic. So the idea is you're keeping kids in the afternoon. Instead of just going home at 3, they're staying in school. Um, some of the studies seem to indicate that what happens after school isn't very academic, and so nothing is happening for anybody. But in the better studies, it's, whoops, it's the low SES kids um, who benefit more. And here's a couple of really the best studies. One is, and this is actually done by Chloe Gibbs, who's now an econ a, a, a professor of economics at uh, Notre Dame. She's one of our students in, at, at Chicago. She did a randomized trial in the state of Indiana where kids were randomly assigned to have half-day kindergarten or full day. This is very common in our country. You can have half, you can go for in the morning, or you can go all day. And on average, there was a benefit of going to the full-day kindergarten, and it was by far more pronounced for the most low-income kids, particularly the kids who, who's, who, were, uh, who were not native speakers of English, were the ones who really benefited. You can imagine going to school all day and getting exposure to academic English all day. So, um, and then double dose algebra is a study that we've been involved we've been involved in for a while. Ta Taco Nomi and I. We have a new study now. This happened in 2003, uh, Chicago. Uh, took all the kids who were, who were low, in ninth grade who were below a certain level of skill, who were going into algebra, which is the, what they teach. In the, you guys probably learned it in China when you were in seventh grade. But they, we learned it in ninth grade, OK, algebra. And um, if you were below a certain level, you were given two periods of math per day, two hours instead of one. And this has made a substantial difference in their learning. And we're now following them and finding that the probability of graduating from college with a four-year degree is increased by the fact that you had two hours of algebra when you were in ninth grade. So increasing instructional time 
will benefit kids, um, it, although this was only the low skill kids who got this. But so we think that taken as a whole, increasing instructional time will reduce inequality, particularly for the young kids. Yes, sir. You know, that's, that, that has actually, so we have, so um, I'm going to tell you about a study of two elementary schools on the south side of Chicago, and there's a very uh, wealthy philanthropist who said what you just said. He said, let's just take these kids away from their parents. <laughs> and um, by the way, this was also done to Native Americans, in, you know, 100 years ago. The Bureau of Indian Affairs took the kids and just took them, literally took them off the reservation and put them into, into these schools. The results were disastrous. Um, so what we think is having them spend more time in school is good, but here's going to be my answer. Don't take them away from their parents. Bring their parents into the school. <laughs> and make them partners in the educational enterprise. And that seems to work much better. But yes, but having more time in school for both and having their siblings come after school, they can tutor. The school can be more of a community, uh, a community um, institution where the entire family can participate. Yes. It could be. And so one of the things that we noticed when we looked at this literature is that in many cases, when the kids, uh, when the regular school day is over, a new staff comes in and they do things with the kids, but they don't have any uh, collaboration with the teachers. So they're not coordinating their efforts. So what we think is that if the, if you coordinate, I'm going to give you some evidence that this works, that if the um, people who are teaching after school are working together with the pe people who are providing instruction during the school day, and the, what's happening after school is tailored to what the kids individually need, that you can make it valuable. Uh, now, you could say, well, you're going to have to change the modality of instruction. You can't just make them sit there the way they did all day. You have to have some other ways of trying to engage them intellectually. There's other ways to engage kids intellectually in conversation and games and so forth that are, that are, that are, that are, uh, that are educative than just making them sit like you guys are right now in these seats with me up here, right? Like, you wouldn't want me to do this for all day, right? I know that, so. Um, yeah, so that's a good question. Yes, sir. Yeah. Is a function of uh, reducing the right. 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 But I think there's an implication there, which is that there's a sense of the delta that builds up over time. And it's more. Yes. More. That's right. But, um, isn't that a kind of bad story? It is. For low SES. Well, so the idea would be by uh, in Increasing the quality of, so here the question I have, answered yet, have, have not yet answered is, is whether we could increase the quality of schooling, and particularly for low SES kids, but for everybody, but particularly for the low SES kids, and so that that accumulation would be much slower and it would be delayed. In other words, the crossover point where schooling becomes disequalizing would be pushed back as far as possible. And the farther we push it back, the closer we come to have something that's more like a, a, the system we want. Whether we'll actually get to the point where we can actually make it go away and would never have a crossover would be maybe a utopian argument. I'm not sure. But that's, that's exactly what, the way I'm thinking. Yeah. But why can't we intervene? Well, the, inter the way we intervene to defect Delta is through Q. We've got to do some instruction somewhere, either, either at home or school. Another argument, and one of my colleagues, Susan Levine, talks about this is, is using the school to help the parents get better at teaching their kids. Sending home books, sending home even uh, games that you can play on your phone or your internet or on a tablet, assisting the parents in becoming better educators is another way. So you're improving Q home for the low SES kids. But one way or another, you're going to have to make those cues better for those low SES kids if you're going to really delay the uh, emergence of, of inequality.
according to this model. Yes. Right. Well, well, of course, we're not going to do everything instantly here. I mean, this is going to have to be take place over time. But you also mentioned the siblings and the possibility of synergy of the Q home being or and school of the siblings. Let's say let's say Q school is better for the older siblings. They can be they can. They'll enrich, you know, presumably, the talk, the conversation, whatever that they're having with their sibling. They can help them with their homework. They can do different things. So there's a lot of ways you can take this in a much more dynamic direction. This model is not very dynamic. It's just sort of looking at one episode after another of schooling. We could try to link these together and see how, what we could do. But I think it's a useful, you know, it's useful to have this framework because we can see the power of schooling and we then see, can see ways of trying to harness it. Um, in fact, in the, um, another conference I'm going to, there's a, there's, a, there's a whole set of talks about how parents can become more effective. But almost all of those strategies involve the school being the intermediary organization that would help the parents. How do we reach the parents? There's two ways in which the larger society reaches parents. One is when you're born and you, at the, you know, you're in the hospital and you, almost everybody in the United States has prenatal care and most people are born in hospitals and they have birth certificates and something you can do then. And then when they go to school, those are the main two ways that, that, that through policy that we can actually reach parents. I mean, there, I'm sure there are some other ways, but those are the, we can reach everybody from those two vantage points. Okay, thank you very much for the conversation. If it cuts short my talk, it's fine. Um, it's better to have the conversation, but I'll, I'm going to press on a little bit. Um, right, so the other way that people have studied increasing the quality of quantity of schooling is by increasing the years of compulsory schooling. This is done in societies all over the, year, all over the world, whereas, for example, in, in the late 40s in Britain, uh, you had to go to school until you were 15, and then they changed the law, and they said, now you have to go to school until you're 16. Well, this happened in many other societies and at different times and places. And from this research, we have uh, uh, Phil Oriopoulos, by the way, who's an economist at the University of Toronto, is kind of the leader of this whole research tendency. And his conclusion is that increased years of schooling make you smarter, richer, happier, and better at parenting. Um, but that said, uh, what we know is that the kids who would have dropped out but are, but are forced to stay in school because of the new policy actually didn't benefit a great deal from the extra year of schooling. They got something out of it, but they got much less out of it than a lot of other kids did. So, so what we're saying here is that, yes, going to school longer when you're older, it helps your skills. But how much benefit you got from that year is not as great as we would have hoped it would be. Okay, so um, so this you know this is part of the argument that the benefit of schooling of a dose of schooling a year of schooling is going to be less for the more uh, disadvantaged kids, the low income kids, than the high income kids. Most of the kids who would drop out of school are low income kids. All right, so let me. Uh, Actually, I don't, how much time do we have? Oh, I got a clock here. OK. And we're good until, <laughs> until. Until four. Oh, the 4.30, that's. Yeah, well, I want to leave plenty, plenty more time for discussion. So let's see, let me see where I want to go from here. Um, yeah, so the summary of this is that uh, the early schooling, um, uh, pre-K, the full day uh, versus half day, that is extending the school day, that these things reduce inequality by boosting instruction for uh, the time of instruction for more low-income kids during the time when those kids are benefiting more from school. Um, that um, the academic year uh, versus the summer, uh, that having a longer academic year uh, would help the low-income kids more than the high-income kids. Um, some evidence in favor of lengthening the school day and uh, 
But we think that the benefits of increasing secondary schooling, the years of secondary schooling are smaller because by then, the, uh, the high SES kids are already benefiting more than the low SES kids. So that's kind of a summary. The, th the theoretical key is you've got to have this counterfactual model of going to school, the effect of going to school versus staying home, and, uh, and so forth. Yeah, so I covered that. Now, the, what I want to talk about now in my remaining time is, OK, so if we have this picture, so what's happening is um, kids, rich and poor, are going to school. P poor kids are benefiting more than rich kids up to a certain point. The skill gaps are beginning to accumulate. And at some point or other, things reverse. And the benefit of going to school, continuing to go to school, is greater for the high-income kids than the low-income kids. That's the basic thesis of this. But that's, that's a fundamental framework for then asking the next question. Can we change this? Can we, can we modify this? Can we intervene to make the quality of schooling better, particularly during that time when kids are, the low-income kids are benefiting more? OK? That, that's what I want to talk about. And, um, and I want to, whoops. I want to talk about two, uh, two randomized trials, just give you a, a brief overview of these, that give us, that, that I've been involved, it's a very egocentric talk because I'm talking about the trials that I've been involved in, but these, these are things that I've, my colleagues and I have been learning, and uh, I don't want to create the impression that we're the only ones learning this stuff, but I just do want to report uh, a couple of things that um, we've been involved in, uh, that, and we can talk about more what we know more generally. Uh, that give us a lot of hope that schooling uh, can be made better and that low-income kids can be benefiting more and that we can, in fact, reduce inequality. And so one is from this book, uh, the, uh, the Ambitious Elementary School, 2017, University of Chicago Press. And the second one is a more recent uh, study of, and this is K, the first one is kindergarten through grade five. And then the, the second one is kids uh, age three to five, so before you go to kindergarten, and we have this fancy name. We call it Longitudinally Adaptive Instruction and Assessment Increases Preschool Children's Numerical Skill. So what we mean by, so here's what we mean by this. Over time, and this is going to be true and really happening in both studies, over time, over the school year, you assess children's skills, and you know what everybody knows. You then design an instructional plan for each and every child, you implement that plan. 10 weeks later, you reassess the children. And you check to see how much they've learned and whether the plan is working. You redesign another plan, and you reassess. So a longitudinally, you're adapting the instruction to the emerging skills of the kids, because kids are really different. And uh, the other thing you're doing that's really tricky is assessment time is very constrained. We figure you can only spend about 15 minutes per ch child in each one of these rounds of assessment, OK, 15 minutes. So to make this assessment work, you have to design the items of the test to be adapted to the current skill level of the child. In other words, if I've got a three-year-old who, who doesn't know much math, and I ask that child 20 questions, the child gets them all wrong. I'm not learning anything. If I ask an older kid this, the, a bunch of easy questions and they got them all right, I don't learn anything. I need to adapt the items to the skill level of the child in order to learn enough in the short amount of time. So that's why we call it so doubly adaptive. We're adapting the instruction. We're predicting where the kids are going to be, and then we're adapting the assessment. So that's basically the way these, both of these randomized trials use this same idea. And so the background of this, it's kind of like a view of this. how do we understand the problem of teaching when, let's just say, you're a kindergarten teacher and a bunch of come, kids come in the door. How do we understand your job? Because what we're going to see is that the kids are extremely heterogeneous in their skill. Because people are different, and also because their homes are different. Their parents are different. And by the way, in a very low-income setting of all African-American kids, you might think, oh, that's a very homogeneous group. It's not. It's extremely heterogeneous. 
the low level is very low, but the kids are all, they're across the whole scale. So this is the problem you face as a teacher, okay? Okay, now we have another problem in our society, and I think not sure it was shared in China, you can tell me. But this, the teachers themselves are very heterogeneous in their skill. Their knowledge of how to teach basic reading, how to teach early math, they're very different. And then, this is the part that may be really different for, uh, between the societies, you can tell me. In our country, historically, teachers have an enormous amount of autonomy. They go in the classroom, shut the classroom door, and in the privacy of their classroom, they do whatever they think is best. I mean, they have a curriculum, but it's a very loose relationship. The curriculum doesn't tell you what to do. So what happens when you take highly heterogeneous kids, you put them in front of highly heterogeneous teachers, and you give those heterogeneous teachers an enormous amount of autonomy. Well, you get inequality. So you, get, you are actually amplifying the inequalities with which the kids came. And of course, that would even be more true if the teacher's skills were related to the SES of the child. That is, if you give the worst teachers to the low SES kids. Right? So, so this is kind of the problem. And so both of these interventions are designed to try to overcome this. This is really the fundamental issue. Um, and so this isn't a daunting engineering problem. And what we're trying to do here is to design the school as an instructional system, not as Sorokin said, a system that sifts and sorts you and decides your social position, but a piece of social machinery that is a, that systematically figures out what you know and what you need to know and make sure you get what you need to know. That's a basically simple idea behind it. Um, so that involves frequently assessing kids' skill, tailoring instruction to the individual children. It means that teachers have to learn a lot because uh, there has to be leadership giving guidance to teachers so that they can learn and they can, they can actually work together across, for example, grade levels so that you, the kids in grade one are gonna know what the kids in grade K learned and they can uh, carry on from there. And it also involves, this is the answer to the question, mobilizing the parents and engaging them in a productive way with their kids. Social supports mean that, so a lot of kids, I don't know if this, again, I have this sort of stereotyped idea that this is a bigger problem in the US than it is in China, but that kids have problems of attention, problems of impulsivity, problems of um, uh, hyperactivity, all kinds of problems that need to be solved. And it means getting the people who do the social service engaged from the very beginning on planning and watching these kids and taking action to prevent them from uh, getting worse. And at the point, what happens in our country a lot is that when kids act out, they get put into what we call special education, referred to, uh, and it, it's, it can be a stigmatizing experience. So we want to avoid that. So we call it a dynamic instructional regime dynamic because you're assessing, you're instructing, you're assessing, instructing a regime because there are rules that guide how this is going to be done. Uh, the idea is to generate or to support in, among the teachers a culture of commitment to every, each and every child. Um, there are certain tools and practices that they need to share, and there's guidance in how to use this. So we're trying to overcome this ultra-autonomous system of teaching. Um, and in our study, uh, what we did, here's what we did. We, there's two schools on the south side of Chicago, which is an overwhelmingly African-American section, about 800,000 African-American people living uh, in a almost completely segregated. Um, uh, and, we ha and what happens is in, e in each school, in each year, um, so these, okay, so I gotta explain. So these two schools are started, these two new schools, and people can apply. So you, you go around, knock on doors, and you try to get people to apply to be in the school. You get a whole lot of people to apply to the school. A lot more people apply than there are places. And you use a lottery to decide who gets in the school. 
and then you follow the winners and losers of the lottery. So you have a randomized trial which, which can assess the causal effect of attending school. It sounds kind of brutal because, you know, if the school is that much better, you're denying kids, but that's the reality of it. There's so many, only so many places in the school. So that's actually what we did. In each, in each school, in each year, in each grade, we have a, a lottery, uh, a pool of kids who have the same probability of getting into the school. And so uh, two south side campuses, each has about 400 students, all African American kids, 80% uh, low income. And just to give you a sense of what I mean by assessment, so this is, you can't read all this stuff, you don't have to. Uh, in reading, there's pre-reading up step one up to 12, step 12. So this is what I meant by, by equality. So step, step 12, you're acquiring, acquiring new vocabulary and concepts through independent reading. You're uh, comprehending texts that are uh, removed from your personal experience. You're able to evaluate them and you're able to uh, ask questions about a story and there's other things you have to be able to do like write. So we want, this is kind of where we want everybody to be. This is where they are at the lowest level. And so every 10 weeks you're being assessed and you're being, there's a plan for you to go to the next step. Wherever, whatever step you're on, you're gonna to go to the next step and the idea, and there's gonna be instructional time as necessary so that everybody by the, let's say grade three, entry to grade three is up here. And the entire school is committed to that. That's what the school does in reading. Everybody is doing this. Every parent knows what step your child is in. Every parent knows what uh, you have to learn, what is the next step, for, how do you get to the next step? and people are working together on that. It doesn't matter what step you're on, as long as you're moving up. Because, okay, some people will get to step 12 a little faster than others. Everybody gets there, we're where we wanna be, with my definition of equality, with reading, all right? Um, so you have to promote teacher learning. Uh, you have to uh, open up the classroom and make it a public space where it can be observed, where people can be evaluated, and people can learn. You can't just shut the door and let everybody work in privacy. Uh, every child can see the progress of every, every teacher can see the progress of every child, including children who are in a different classroom. So if, you're, if one teacher's kids are very similar to yours and their kids are surging ahead, you can figure out why, you gotta go figure out why is that happening? What can I do to make it better? Okay. Um, so people know, you know, they're learning, they're trying to solve problems and seeking collaboration, okay. Um, accountability for the principal, accountability for the teachers. Teachers who get really good at this get to become coaches and possibly principals. Uh, there's an upward mobility, which we don't generally have in our system. Usually how much you get paid is strictly determined by how long you've been there. It's uh, nothing to do with your skill. Here's an objective basis for deciding who needs to be, you know, who can be promoted because the teachers who are really good at producing the skill actually found out that this is something like this is happening in Shanghai. In Shanghai. Uh, I was stunned. I said, well, I thought we invented this. Not true. Um, as I said, expand instructional time just the way we mentioned, especially for the kids who are furthest behind and in the subjects that are furthest behind and mobilizing parents. Okay, I think I said all that. Um, oh, the other thing is, um, I don't know, again, in our country now it's mattering a lot which, when you get out of primary school, which is when you're about uh, 12, it matters a lot what next school you go to. And so there's a lot of counseling to help people choose the next school. And the idea would be that this would happen in, in high school as well, that kids would learn where they can apply to go to college. Because what we find is that low SES kids, high SES kids have a lot of information from their parents and their neighbors and their relatives about how to manage the transitions into school. But low SES kids have less information, so we're saying the school has to provide all the information to the low income kids that the highest income kids are, are typically going to be getting. Um, so we have these lotteries. Uh, these are what we call uh, intent to treat effects. They don't mean too much except to say that the, the winning the lottery uh, boosts in for grade three, four, five, and then for the middle, interestingly enough, this is the middle school is after they've left the school. 
So the gains that we see for the experimental group, the kids who won the lottery, uh, are persisting. They're not fading. This is one of the biggest things we see in intervention research is the fade out of skills. They're actually persisting even after the kids leave the school. Sorry, and uh, like a value-added math score? This is just uh, using, okay, what we did here for the outcome was we did this for reading and math, and we used a multivariate model to see if the results were different, and they weren't. So we just comp com created a composite score of your reading and math achievement. And we, yeah, so they get assessed every year at the spring of the year. Uh, and, and these are the same, you know, it's a little complicated because kids are coming in at different times and they're staying at different times depending on when they came into the study. But it's, yeah, it's, all, it's, all ran, it's all based on random assignments. So these are unbiased estimates of this. And, and by the way, these are underestimates of the actual real effect because not all the kids who win the lottery go to the school and some of the kids who lose the lottery end up in the school. So this we call non-compliance. Um, but maybe a little more meaningful summary is this. So here is um, the, uh, this is where the African American kids are, no, this is where the kids who lost the lottery and therefore were not able to go to school would be in this distribution here. This, this sort of lighter colored thing is the distribution of white kids in Chicago, which is a pretty advantage group nowadays. The people who actually live in the center city who are white are more advantaged than they used to be. And the green group is the kids who won the lottery and therefore were able to attend the school. And so what we're saying is that going to the school moves you from the blue distribution to the green distribution. I don't know if that looks like a big effect to you, but I can tell you that if you're in the uh, blue distribution, you are on average at the 26th percentile of the white kids in Chicago. So that means 74% of the white kids in Chicago outscore you. But if you're in the green distribution, you're at the 44th percentile of the white distribution. You're not at the 50th. That would be completely eliminating the black-white test score gap. But you're at the 44th instead of being at the 26th. These are very, very big effects, actually. Um, and they're persistent. Um, OK, so I am not going to tell you everything about this other study except to say very briefly that we're concerned about, you see, we're concerned about this gap that kids come in with kindergarten. And what I was just saying was, what does the school do who see, that you see this? How do you overcome this? So what we'd like to be able to do is reduce this at the outset. We'd like to see the kids coming in much more equal. So we said, well, let's go back to preschool and let's use this same kind of assessment, instruction, dynamic regime and let's do an experiment. And uh, in we, the experiment we had was on, in math, actually, um, because we got, not, not because we don't like reading, but because that's how we got the funding. Like, people gave us money to study math. You can get, if you want to get money just to study math, it's, you get more money than if you study reading. We're trying to get money to get study reading. So we took this gap from the early childhood longitudinal study, but in, in math, actually, and what we did was we did a big field test uh, of various, various aspects of math, and we said, we want to figure out what are the ingredients of that gap and how do we overcome them, okay? So, um, so let me see if, let me, let me go to some, yeah, so, so our great developmental psychologist, I wouldn't know this, I've learned a lot from Susan Levine, Susan Golden Meadow, my colleagues in psychology, so five numerical skills seem to be really key for understanding the gap between rich and poor kids in the, nation, in the nation, according to our field test. Counting, cardinality, comparing and ordering sets, operations, and written numerals. Basically, the idea is kids need to know the count list. One, two, they need to know that, how, say, one, two, three, four, five. They need to know that, they need to know one to one. One, two, three, four, five. Like if you take a child and you say, count my fingers, they'll say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, like that, right? So they need want to know the one to one, and then they need to know that the last number is the size of the set. So now that they know what the size of the set, that's called cardinality. I just tell a story. If you tell, I never knew this, but if you tell a child, um, 
who, who doesn't have cardinality, you say, how many fingers am I holding up? The child will say, three. And then if you say to the child, okay, here's a bunch of marbles. Give me three marbles. They'll give you like seven or 10 or 15 or something. Because they, they really think that three is any number greater than two. So this is three. And so are the seven marbles that I just gave you. Right? And you don't know that until you ask them to give you the marbles. You think they know it because they can count your finger. They can see that this is three. So there's a one knower, there's a two knower, there's a three knower, there's a four knower, and then there's a debate. But suddenly you become a cardinal principle knower. Once you're a cardinal principle knower, then you understand set size, and now you can compare and order sets. And now you're getting ready to add, like if I know a set has seven, I add two. And I don't have to start over counting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, because I know I have five and two more. And I understand five, and I understand two, and I understand seven. And so now kids are ready, and they're starting to do math. And they have to know the, some, then there are other operations, and there's numerals. So there's this sort of hierarchy. And it's really an epiphany to teachers who are of preschool children to understand what you have to know and when you have to know it, and to see children that right in front of your eyes, who you thought knew three, and they don't know it, and you have to teach them what three is, and then you move to four, and you move them up. And these things are related to social background, how, how early kids learn cardinality. Now, in the larger universe, it probably doesn't matter whether you lear, learn cardinality when you're three years old or seven years old. And, you know, if you, if, but in our society, it matters, because if you're behind when you go to kindergarten, and then you get put in the lowest group, and you, know, all, all kind, you get behind and so forth, and you get frustrated. So, so that's kind of how this works. So anyway, to, very, to, to wrap this up, because I'm, I'm talking too long. Um, Here's kind of what the teachers see. This little guy here, that's a 95% confidence interval. This particular student is, is kind of here. And we want this student to be up here, to be where you're going to be up with the high SES kids. And this kid is down here. So we're going to have to move this kid up here. So that's the basic idea. So anyway, uh, we did a study. We had 98 teachers within 49 classrooms, 400 kids. We randomly assigned the block the classrooms match them in terms of make them similar in terms of various things, randomly assign the classrooms, teach the teachers how to assess their kids, how to then design instruction, and voila, you know, we get uh, a, a very sizable uh, effect. So now we have some evidence that using this dynamic instructional idea, we can actually reduce gaps before they get into kindergarten. And then from the other study, we we're hoping, you know, because we know how to handle them once they come in. So the idea is to put together this sort of um, the regime of what we have to do in different domains of cognitive skill in order to reduce this gap. And I'll just go to the very end of this and say uh, that, yes, uh, we do think that school improvement can reduce social inequality. Um, and so once we see this being demonstrated, uh, and then we, can then we can model what the future effects of this, the long-term effects of these gains would be, we have to ask ourselves, do we have the will to do this? How much are we willing to invest? And these interventions are not terribly expensive. And are we willing to learn how to do this stuff? And so my conclusion is, the children are ready. Are we? Thank you. Thank you. Could you go back to the slide with the uh, distributions of the intent to treat effects? Sure, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, the distributions, and I kind of glossed over the fact that these distributions are actually, uh, they're actually comply our average causal effects. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I had would have thought that maybe the, the variance of these yeah. curves would change. I mean, the adaptive process okay. should help the poor. So I would have expected maybe be yeah. a little thinner. The One would hope. Um, we didn't see that. I'm not sure how much power we had in our study to really um, test that. We had these kids at all these different ages. And, but I mean, that's a very interesting question. So I mean, these graphs are a stylized representation that kind of assumes the variances are equal oh, to the, the okay. common variance. Yeah, we really don't have, uh, I, I don't know. I'm not sure we have a stable enough estimate, particularly because they are actually so-called 
I don't know, comply our average causal effects to know what the impact was on the variance of that. You know, that's a little bit beyond what we are typically doing with those kinds of effects. But that's a great question. Because right. yes. you could like yeah. literally measure the inequality Absolutely. of scores and see if the inequality. Right. I mean, here the inequality is strictly the inequality is a function of social back, a of race, actually, in this case. But yes, within race inequality, for example. And uh, one of the, one, another famous Chicago person, when I mentioned Coleman and Wilson, Benjamin Bloom, had this theory of mastery learning that said exactly what you're saying, that as you move every, when you make, when you make mastery of, of the subject matter your goal, you not only increase the mean, you reduce the variance. But uh, that's a great point. In fact, and the, other, really the other question I had was, yeah. to what extent, are, you, you described this SES differences, to what extent are those all captured in the actual skill measures? In other words, if I'm from a poor SES background, yeah. but I have a kid who somehow gets a high score, right. is he pretty much going to be like all the high SES kids with the same score? Or do, is it still in the future, I'm always going to have to worry that he's not going to learn as much? Or, is it really well, SES or is it really all proxied by the actual skill distribution? Well, you know, I think that, you know, those cues are coming into play as well as those future cues and those future, you know, you're, you're boosting the delta, which means the kid has a better capacity to benefit from future instruction. But if those cues aren't forthcoming later on, you know what I'm saying, then maybe it's not going to work very well, uh, you know, as well as you would hope. So, I mean, because the irony of this is that quality of instruction at home and school is worse for low SES kids. But, the, but on the other hand, they're benefiting more from going to school. What we want to do is make, is is make that first, we want to equalize those cues, right? So I, th I think, you know, we see in a lot of literature this fade out. Kids get this initial boost. They, they're in some very high-end preschool, peri preschool, you know, and yeah. then they go to school and they don't really fall back. The other kids catch up. And we can discuss why that happens. I think the most compelling theory of that, that Greg Duncan, I've, I've argued this, Greg Duncan has really made this point a lot, is that if you're a teacher in kindergarten and you have a bunch of kids, low-income kids, and let's say three of those kids had the experimental treatment and they're up here, but the other kids didn't, and if you pitch your instruction to the median of the classroom, those three kids are not going to benefit from the instruction. Nobody is capitalizing on what you learned in your preschool program because everybody didn't get the intervention. Everybody got the intervention. The, the K teacher could peg the instruction at a higher level. But since only three out of 25 got it, it isn't going to happen. It's because our experiments are very small, small scale. You know, I'm, I'm not sure if that's a good answer to your question. Hi, can you help describe a little bit more about your dynamic instruction? Is it, you know, mostly human capital, which is the teachers being trained and the assessments are still paper-based? Or how much of it is enabled by technology? Just so with the little kids, um, there's not too much help coming from machines yet because the, the, the assessments of the children are one to one, one teacher with one child. And there are a lot of props, they're manipulatives, they're games that the, te that the teacher is actually playing with the kids that involve, like I said, the marbles and, you know, moving things around and, turn, you know, sh there's a spatial side to sh shifting, rotating things. And so the, the kids are actually using their hands and so forth to do this stuff. So we, we think that for the little kids, these manipulatives are pretty important. Um, where, where technology is helping is that um, as soon as you put in the numbers, you, you've got this machine that computes the kids' trajectory. So we call it a Bayesian learning model. So what it does is it tells you what your best estimate is of that kid's current skill. You re-estimate the trajectory of a kid up to that time. You predict where their future skill is. You know, all of that is done like that by the machine. So it's the, it, there's that kind of sort of data analysis assistance that the teacher is getting. But, a lot, but really what's happening is the teacher is interacting with the child in doing the assessments. And we think, actually, that that's actually helping the teacher learn how to do the instruction. So what I hear you saying is it's sort of a combination, especially at the early yeah. age. There's a lot of manipulatives with a teacher interacting with a child. Right. But you input those numbers somewhere. Yes. And then that's, and how frequent are these tests? Every there's 10 weeks. 10 weeks, okay. For 15 yeah. minutes. For 15 minutes per child. And that's a big cost. That's one of the biggest problems, because 15 minutes per child 
most of the preschool class, all the preschool classrooms we had, you probably saw the numbers, they have two teachers, usually for about 20 kids. So we have to think about the context in which this is occurring. So one of the teachers can be doing the assessments while the other teacher is with the class. In the, in the kindergarten situation, you know, K through five, it's a little more complicated. You've got to bring the coach in to do the instruction while the teacher is assessing the children. So you've got to have a much more nimble organization of the school. The coaches or even the school principal is in there teaching. And by the way, we think that's actually a benefit. Having an expert teacher teach the children of a teacher is another way to learn about that teacher's teaching. You know, if you come and teach my kids, you're going to learn about me. And, 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 and you can help, you have insights. Hi. Can you pass? I have a question about the um, sort of different context, East Asian context, okay. where schooling itself is not enough to have a social mobility because everybody competes. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that there, there, th that creates another kind of inequality yeah. where lower SES kids only get schooling, good schooling, but only schooling, and high SES kids um, get schooling plus all the other education. You mean like all the tutoring and all of the classes? Or resources, the, yeah. uh, good package they can get yeah. during the summer. Um, so this kind of educa uh, inequality perhaps needs different take than uh, your suggestion. What, what would you suggest? Uh, well, there, I mean, I think if I understand what you're saying, and I do understand about the, what do you, what, what's the word you use for all the extra outside stuff that you do when the, there's a word for that, right? Um, <laughs> you know, all of the, the, like, I think you're talking about the fact that parents are getting tutoring for their kids and, and also, yeah. college, college entrance. Right, they're getting, so they're having a lot. So what's happening is the high SES kids are just getting more instruction. Right? They're just getting more of it. Outside. They're getting more instruction outside of school, right. Um, so it seems, I don't know, you guys can maybe have to tell me the answer to this because I don't know what's possible, but it seems like that's not very fair, and you would want to have more kids have access to that. Uh, now I don't know exactly how to make that happen, because you know it doesn't seem you can. It doesn't seem like to create equality you can stop the high SES parents from giving that stuff to their kids. That isn't going to happen. So how do you create more opportunities? Well, make if the school day were longer and there were a richer array of resources coming into the school to, in different ways, that would probably blunt the effect. I would imagine. Um, you know, you, but I, I think you were, some of you were saying earlier, you don't want the school day to just stay the same and make it longer. You've got to mix it up and make it more interesting. And, you know, I don't know how, but how do they, how do the high SES kids stand all of this barrage of extra instruction? Do they like it? Or it doesn't matter. They're willing to do it. They're happy. Maybe the low SES kids would be willing to if they had the opportunity. I'm not, I don't think I have a great answer. It's probably a policy issue that would have to be figured out in the context of the, of the system that you're working in. But it does seem like, the, the, if anything, that system uh, where the high SES kids are getting a lot of extra schooling would, would actually rapidly, would sort of uh, in, amplify the growth of inequality earlier instead of, right? It sort of takes everything I say and makes it a little bit worse to do that in terms of inequality. I mean, you're you're increasing the human capital of the nation by that all, but but it's but it's but it's it's coming, uh, it's benefiting a smaller subset of people. Do you think homeschooling is a big problem for inequality? Well, homeschooling, which is, I mean, most of the people, it's it really depends. I think there seem to be two different kinds of homeschooling that I've seen in, the, in our country. One is um, people who have a lot of uh, human capital themselves, a lot of education and a lot of skill and they have enough and they, have, uh, they can live on one person's salary. So the other person can stay, the other person has high human capital and can stay home with the child. That child, I have a friend who did that who went to Harvard and his wife and all of their kids went to Harvard. 
You know what I'm saying? So, you know, so that's probably an N equals one anecdote. But then the other kind of homeschooling, we have people who are very religious. They have these certain kind of religious beliefs. They don't want their kids to go to school. And it's not clear that they have a lot of human, you know, uh, Q, high Q in terms of academic instruction. It's not clear to me that their kids are getting any benefit from academic instruction of, of being at home. So it's probably very heterogeneous as a function of who's doing the homeschooling. Yeah, that would be my guess. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. I guess my question sort of builds on, of course, on your wonderful talk, but also on the questions that have been asked. So, um, and, and maybe it's just I didn't fully understand the equation. Um, but you have Q home, you have Q school, right. and then you have this delta. Right. But what about the interaction between Q home and Q school? I mean, I think a lot of these questions are getting oh, at. Yeah. Basically, the parents mm. can well, play, and you see this, I think, in the U.S. with children with special education needs, right, where the parent often ends up being the chief advocate for connecting all these resources for their child. And, of course, it tends to be parents of a certain SES or higher who has the time and the resources to make these connections. But I think similarly, um, you know, at, at times the Q home becomes Q school if parents choose to homeschool their children for a variety of reasons, or parents are able to then, I think a lot of parents in Asia, but I assume in competitive uh, re districts in the US, they can intervene directly in the school system to work with the teachers in a way that um, it's not just the quantity of instruction, right. but then the quality of instruction can become more tailored to their children. Got you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, there's a lot of literature uh, growing about the, the power of high SES people to shape the school experiences of their children, and, and even to the point where um, it seems that some high SES parents feel emboldened to supervise the teachers. You know, they, 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 they have higher status than the teacher. Usually, usually we think of the teacher as being, having the high status, and the parent is sort of very happy to have the high status professional, but not with the highest stat, high status parents feel, they, they have a sense of superiority over the teachers that can go in to the school and shape the school. So the way that would be revealed in my model, so in, in my model, Q home and Q school can't happen at the same time. You're either at home or you're at school. So it's, the, it's Q home minus Q school is the, the, effect, the effect of going from home to school on the quality of instruction. What you're saying is the parents have the capacity to increase Q school. That they they might be overreaching or reaching. I don't know if yeah. it's overreaching from Q home into so, Q school. Yeah, so, so we've already had, you know, so one way that the high SES parents could make sure their kids get a high, there's a bunch of ways that a high SES, high income family can make sure that Q school is really good for their child. One is to go in and get in, intervene in the school and make sure the child gets the right teacher and make sure that the teacher does the right thing and all that other stuff, as well as choosing the right school or maybe paying for a better school if it's a private school. So there's a lot of ways in which parents can intervene to make Q school maximum. And all of those ways pretty much favor the high SES parent. But those are all, all going to create a higher, in my model, those are all going to make Q school higher for the, for the rich kids. Oh, so that just gets folded into Q school. Yeah, it's one of the causes of Q school is, is the parental interventions. Exactly. In my model, that's the way it would work. Yeah, right. Thank you for asking. It's a great question. Uh, yeah, I think so. I guess I, if I'm saying yes, I guess I can because I know what you asked me. Um, yeah. Do you think that maybe desegregation, um, bringing rich people into uh, poor schools, for example, actually helps improve the quality of school much faster than if you were to uh, use these experimental methods? You know, that's a really great question, and one that's been debated and studied for a long time. And I don't think, I think the answer is that we don't have much evidence that simply, that just the simple desegregation of schools will uh, make schools better for low-income kids. That, Taking, in fact, the evidence that we see, the, the low-income kids who are in a high-income, high SES school are not doing better, are not going to do better than they would if they were in a low SES school. That just sounds crazy to you, maybe, but that's what we're seeing. Now, I want to make one really important ex exception. There's a, uh, a young man by the name of Rucker Johnson, who's a, uh, an economist at Berkeley, who studied school legal school desegregation. This is where we used to have, in, you know, throughout the South, 
legally, and even in the North, actually, in Boston, for example, uh, by law, uh, black kids were going to a different set of schools from white kids. And the, those, those decisions, those court decisions that forced desegregation had a beneficial effect on black kids. But Rucker argues that that effect occurred because they had, those kids then had better resources for, for learning. They had more, more time in school. So you might not even realize it. So back in the day, in the rural South, if you were black, you could be going to school for six hours a day, and if you were for, uh, I'm sorry, for six months a year, and if you were white, you'd go to school for nine months a year. Because you're, if you're black, you're supposed to be out in the cotton field picking cotton. Schools only went to eighth grade in the rural South if you were black. In the, in the same areas, white kids would go to school until 12th grade. Unless you went to a city and then you went to a segregated school with few resources. So um, Rucker Johnson argues that the positive impact of desegregation was mostly on giving people better instruction and better resources, not strictly because their classmates were of a different peer you know, background. Now, yeah. I, that's, that, that, I don't think the, the, the question has been fully answered, but that's what I'm reading of the research. Yeah, that's what I meant, really. Yeah. <laughs> because infrastructure can be improved after their parents come in to intervene with the school, et cetera. Right. In some sense, you know, when black kids went to schools with white kids, they were going to schools that the that white parents had had invested yeah. in and made better. So in that sense, you're right. Right. Okay, I got you. But just so I guess Brucker would say, um, the fact that I'm sitting in a classroom with with white people doesn't make me get smarter. What makes me get smarter is when I have better teaching. And I'm going to get better teaching if I'm in a place where people are investing more in, in school in the resources for instruction. Marks, okay. yeah, right. uh, so the question uh, you talk about the counterfactual, right? Right. So I I'm not you know, the, familiar with the U.S. context that you have counterfactual. That means uh, for s you have to have got some student in the same the early uh, different age 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 uh, you know different stage, right? Uh, they are some are in school, some are out school, right? Well, my model is saying at any one moment, yeah. yes. if I go to school or stay at home, oh. at any one moment. So I'm saying. Let's say I'm a pre. I'm I'm four years old. I'm going to go to pre-K or I'm not. Yes. I'm six years old. I'm going to have or no. I'm five years old. I'm going to have full day kindergarten or half day kindergarten. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yes. Yeah. But so it, for it, for formal schooling, uh, so so that would be for some compulsory, right? So every kid should be in school, right? So you don't have to do right. Much. Uh, well, the way we have a counterfactual for universal pre-K is because of that age cutoff. Oh. You know, and, and, also, and also there's a year cutoff, too. So there's age and year, because last year we didn't have pre-universal. This year we do. So we can compare the age. We can, you know, if there's anything screwy happening with the ages, we can take the, the kids who are on the, this side or that side of the age cutoff before the policy happened, and that's going to be a placebo test. You see what I'm saying? We shouldn't see any effect then. There was no policy. Then, but then when, it, when there's actually universal pre-K, now the age gap should really go into play. So the, those two things, it's kind of a beautiful design because it gives us the counterfactual. The counterfactual for the kid who's born on uh, August 29th is the kid who's born on September 2nd. You know, or the, the, the set of kids, shall we say. And those, we're assuming those kids are randomly different because, you know, we're assuming that the... Bo being born at one of those two times is effectively random. There's, there's nothing that predicts that. Exactly. Okay, great. And uh, some, some questions about, uh, about uh, uh, you know, the, the, the cultural difference, right? These are really important. The most of your study are in the U.S. context, right. and you know, some are cited in, in different nations, but right. we don't see that uh, in East Asia. Right? That's what uh, we are really interested in. Uh, yeah. I look forward to you know, read more of your work and uh, sometimes in the future, uh, research design or something, you know, applying for, for grants, right? Uh, to <laughs> apply all this, you know, to test it in different, uh, you know, social contexts. Particularly, you mentioned about uh, you know, some uh, some some practice, a right? policy practice in in Shanghai. I've noticed, uh, you know, they actually have a, have a, I think for PISA, they have a, you know working documents on how they, you know, the government uh, policy trying to reduce 
uh, inequality yeah. in different schools. Right. You know, they pair schools, right? The good school and the, and the, and the low quality schools, they, they pair them to make uh, like education groups to you know, send teachers to those local schools. Right. But unfortunately for those kind of data, they only have, like PISA is the one, one shot, right? So yeah, you don't have the, you don't have the causal side of it. Yes. But, you know, I think really important, like, I know that uh, I was asking somebody how many kids were in the class and that she was teaching in Shanghai, 45. So if, you know, whereas let's say you have 20 or 25, how do you do the individual instruction, you know, in a class of 45? That's going to be a lot harder. So. Yeah, we once also have a, you know, just last, we once also, we need the, you know, the, the evidence, really hard evidence based, right? You know, discussion on education policy. I remember just a while ago in Hong Kong, there is uh, because of the decline of fertility, right? So the government tried to shut down many some schools, and right. uh, then there is argument that bring, uh, brought about about you know the U.S. American context, you know the the, the class size and the, right. you know teaching qualities, right? Right. Uh, so there are many discussions on this, but uh, right. it turned out that there is no uh, you know, data, you know, rigorous. Right, and so whenever there is one of these changes, you know, what the government does something. <clears throat> through policy, you want to see if you can construct a natural experiment to exploit the causal effect of that. Yes. You know, figure out a way to get the counterfactual comparison. You know, that's, that's part of the trick. And then the other part of it is trying to do more of these randomized trials so that we can have some really strong causal evidence. Th th those things would really help a lot. I mean, the more we do, I know, I mean, I know that the, there's a tremendous increase in the amount and, and the quality of research in China. It's very exciting to see what whether you'll get similar results. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank, thank you. you.